So in this course, we're going to develop uh, models uh, of economics like and business cycles. Before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about um, existing macro models uh, and existing models of the business cycle. So when you start studying uh, business cycles, you realize that there are a lot of uh, existing models. People you know, have been developing models of business cycle for more than a century. Um, and it, you know, it looks like a big mess. Um, there are a lot of different things. You don't necessarily know how they are related, these different models. Um, a lot of these models make uh, strikingly different assumptions. It's, you know, it's not clear why they make this or that assumption. Um, they seem to take also very different approaches and you know, clearly each approach has its advantage, it's also its disadvantage. Um, and you know, it just, it's just hard to understand why um, people make all these different uh, assumptions and um, how these models are all interconnected. Um, it really you know, looks like a big mess uh, when you start looking at this business cycle literature, and it's hard to see what the common thread is uh, across all these models. Um, and what's particularly frustrating is that a lot of these assumptions seem uh, fairly arbitrary, um, and yet people you know, uh, really st you know, stick to them or really attach to them, um, and so you don't exactly know uh, why that's the case. Um, and it also looks like different papers or different groups of papers really talk past each other. That, you know, there is really, it, it's hard to see sometimes uh, what the debate is all about. Like people seem to be focusing on completely different things and just talk past each other. Um, so I feel it's important to understand a little bit um, the structure uh, of uh, science. If you want to have a little model of science, that then we can apply to business cycle research to understand what's going on. And once we have that little model of science, uh, we'll, you know, we'll be able to see a bit uh, what's going on. We'll have a little bit of a structure in mind, and then we'll be able to relate all the different strands of our business cycle research and everything would make uh, much more sense. And it'd be easier also to evaluate the assumptions that people make and kind of the approaches that people take. Um, so, the uh, model of science that I want to talk about is a model uh, that was developed by Thomas Kuhn in two wonderful books. Um, the first one that I highly recommend is the Copernican uh, Revolution. This one that you can see by Thomas Kuhn. Um, this is really uh, a great book. Um, first edition, uh, I think, was... Um, oh. Yes, um, 1957, and then um, it has been, oh, there's only one edition of this one. So 1957, great book that looks at um, the evolution of uh, planetary astronomy from the antiquity, uh, basically to today, but mostly it's talking about the uh, Ptolemaic system of uh, astronomy, so a system that's, um, was developed in the antiquity with the Earth at the middle of the universe and then the stars and the suns rotating uh, around the Earth. Um, and then discussing, you know, the, uh, then the big uh, revolution that happened at the end of the Middle Ages uh, with the Copernican system that was uh, proposed by uh, Copernicus. So the idea that now it's in fact the sun that's at the middle of uh, the universe, and then the planets are rotating uh, around the sun. And so that was a huge uh, change. Um, and so looking at this evolution, then Kuhn realizes that there is, you know, uh, a more general structure. Uh, you know, you could actually understand the evolution of all the sciences. Uh, and so um, then he has a second book that's much shorter that generalizes this little model of science that he developed when looking at uh, astronomy and he applies it to all kinds of other sciences uh, to highlight the generality of the system. So the second book is um, The Structure of Scientific Revolution. 
uh, that was published a little bit uh, later. I think first edition of this one is five years later, I think 1962. Um, and these are several editions of this book um, in which he applies you know, what he learned with, um, with astronomy to all kinds of other sciences, um, like for instance, chemistry, um, and so on. Um, and so I want to discuss a little bit that model of science, and then we'll be able to uh, apply to macro and understand a bit what has been happening. So the core building block of Kuhn's model of science is a paradigm. Um, and so what is a paradigm? Um, a paradigm is really, um, it's a way that scientists organize a whole body of, uh, of knowledge and then they use that uh, paradigm to interpret what they observe in uh, nature. So the paradigm is really a way to organize a large you know, body of information and then use it to look uh, at the world. So it's really a lens through which scientists of a particular era look at the world. Um, so um, of course, at the core of a paradigm, you have a theory or a model that all the scientists that belong to that paradigm uh, use. Uh, so that's like a theoretical um, construct that uh, the uh, scientists use to look at the world. So if we think about macro, you know, a very successful and famous paradigm would be the real business cycle uh, paradigm that started, you know, in the 80s with famous paper by uh, Kidden and Prescott and Long and Plosser. Um, and then, you know, continued even up to um, today. So if we think about the real business cycle padding, what would be a core model of the real business cycle padding? Well, it's a macro model in which you have uh, Valrasian competitive markets. Uh, you, know, you have competitive markets for labor, competitive markets for goods. Uh, these are uh, also it's usually a dynamic models and uh, in which uh, households are completely rational. And when you have, a, usually you have uncertainty in there and household form rational expectations. So all of the, you know, this type of models, of real business cycle models, that's really what would be like the key theory at the center of the real business cycle uh, paradigm. Um, but a paradigm is not only a model or a theory. There are a lot of other things that are attached to it. So. A paradigm is also the it also encompasses the facts that the scientists in that you know that belong to that school of thought are particularly interested in because different sci scientists who belong to different paradigms over the ages are going to be interested in different facts. Actually, they are going to focus on different facts. Um, so if you think uh, and they are going to look at different objects. So for instance, in the real business cycle paradigm, um, productivity plays a very important role, and in fact. You know, uh, a key idea is that productivity shocks are going to be drivers of business cycle. So researchers in the real business cycle paradigm are going to pay a lot of attention at, uh, to productivity and productivity shocks, you know, in a way that researchers in other paradigms didn't do. So for instance, if you, you know, if, if you look at um, older models in macro, like, you know, if you read uh, Keynes' uh, general theory, or if you look at models of, say, uh, disequilibrium, you know, productivity just doesn't show up. It's not something that um, people in this older paradigm would look at. Um, so that's, you know, that's one example of a, a fact and empirical objects that people in the real business cycle paradigm care about, but other uh, people in other paradigm may not care about. You know, if we think about, uh, to give you another example, if you think about the new Keynesian paradigm, which came uh, later in macro, an object that the people in that paradigm care a lot about are, say, inflation expectation, because this inflation expectation, they matter a lot for the New Keynesian Phillips curve. Again, that's something that, you know, people in that paradigm care a lot about. They've designed surveys to measure this inflation expectation. They talk about it a lot, but people in the, you know, previous school of thought in macro, they didn't care about this inflation expectation. So they, they would have nothing to do with them. Um, so here, I just want to say that it's not just that the models are different, even the facts that people look at are different. Another thing that differs also is the kind of acceptable research practices and research methodologies. Even that differ across paradigms. So for instance, in the real business cycle paradigm, 
Um, there is also like a very clear procedure about how you, you do things. You, know, you build a model, then you're going to calibrate that model, then you're going to simulate that model, and then you're going to compare what happens in the model to the same moments in the real world. Like that's a typical, uh, that's you know, typical kind of approach that's taken there. In terms of methodology, something that's also very unique to the real business cycle paradigm is using, you know, looking at data and using a filter to detrain the data. So typically a Hodrick Prescott filter, and then just to, you know, and then the business cycle then becomes whatever is a departure from that trend. So departure from the trend is what, you know, is called the business cycle and what people are going to, uh, to focus on. Uh, but again, like this idea of taking a Roderick Prescott filter and then looking at uh, separating the trend from deviation from trend, that's something that also very, uh, tech, you know, a research methodology that's very specific uh, to the real business cycle paradigm. So a paradigm is a model or a theory, but also a set of facts that uh, people consider relevant, a set of methodologies uh, that are acceptable, a set of research problems that are acceptable, and a set of you know, answers uh, that are also acceptable. All of that consists uh, of paradigm. I, I just another example that uh, comes to mind. So something that for some reason uh, is unacceptable in the real business cycle paradigm is to use diagrams. Uh, somehow this is considered to be not okay. And they have always this saying that uh, a picture is worth a thousand words. Then people in the real business cycle paradigm, what they say is, oh, an equation is worth a thousand pictures. Which, if you think about it, is a little bit silly because usually the graphs that you present are just exact representation of the equation. It is almost isomorphic, an equation and a, and a graph. You just plot, you know, the equation. Um, and in fact, often you can learn much more from a, from diagrams than just from the sheer equation. And if you think about set differential equation, if you just look at two differential equations, it's really hard to know how that system operates. If you plot a phase diagram, then you learn really a lot from how that system of differential equation works. Uh, so that seems, you know, a bit strange to say, no, we are not going to use diagrams. We are not going to use graph. We just use equations. Uh, but nevertheless, that's a research methodology uh, that has been embraced uh, by that paradigm. You know, it's, you know, it's nothing bad about it. It's just to say that a paradigm is more just than a model. So a paradigm is uh, a theory and a shared of uh, a set of shared norms and standards that at a point in time is universally accepted by the people in the field. Um, and the way that you actually can identify paradigm is that often uh, you have a textbook that's going to be, uh, or several textbooks that are written and that summarize uh, everything that uh, the paradigm stand for, stand for. So textbooks are really the way that uh, paradigms are um, summarized and uh, and represent and represented, and then they are used. Of course, the textbook textbooks are used uh, to educate undergraduate students, graduate students, and so to pass along these theories and these norms and standards that the paradigms stand for. So, in the case of the real business cycle model, that has been a bit of a running example. Um, that kind of main textbook is. Uh, this one, uh, the frontiers of business cycle research. Um, so this is a collection of uh, chapters that was really written. Uh, so in the 90s, with the idea of summarizing everything that the real business cycle paradigm stands for. And, and you can see, actually, if you look at the table of content, you have chapters that are uh, about models. So here I'm just showing you the beginning. I don't know if you can see properly, but you have uh, chapters that are about models, so chapter four, models with heterogeneous agents, but you have many chapters that are just about methodology and trying to flesh out the type of methodology that's acceptable for um, the paradigm. So recursive methods to compute um, equilibria, um, for instance, is uh, one example that there where all these methodologies are fleshed out. Uh, so that's what a paradigm uh, is.